Okay, so we'll start with uh, David Edwards uh, with an introduction. One minute. Hello, I'm David Edwards. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. This is the first time I've done something like this. Um, I was born in this state. I consider California to be one of the greatest places on the planet. We've got the eighth largest economy. What we do, the world watches. And I thought uh, it would be good to provide uh, another point of view and another choice for the first assembly. Uh, I raised my kids here. I uh, grew up in the Monterey Bay area. I've been in the Grass Valley area for about three years. That'll do me. Measure A, Measure B. The last time I debated here in front of you, we were in a mighty struggle, if you all remember that, with the stubborn and aggressive public employees unions. Remember how difficult it was then? They spent close to $185,000 trying to elect a union-friendly majority to the city council and to defeat measures A and B. We know how that ended. Measure A had a 70% approval. Measure B, 64% approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have received $6.5 million in concessions and $27 million in deferred liability costs for our retirement health care. Look up here, and who do you see that can go to Sacramento and fight that battle? Thank you. Hello, I'm Brian Daly. Thank you for the opportunity to coming here and being able to speak to you. I'm a third generation farmer, native of California, actually born right here in Redding. I live up in Lassen County. Uh, my family was homesteaders. I own and operate Big Valley Seed Company. I have full and part-time employees. I've also had the opportunity to serve on the Lassen County Board of Supervisors for the last 16 years. Our county is debt free. We have funded or unfunded liability. And I believe that I'm the only one up here that can be able to say that as a public agency. Thank you, and I look forward to this debate. Hi, I'm Charlie Hooper. This country was founded on an idea. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know what? The founders of this country were geniuses, and they got it right. What we need to do is combine the, the awesome power of individual liberty with limited and frugal governments. And we haven't seen much of that in Sacramento recently, have we? Which is why Sacramento needs some adult supervision. <laughs> I wrote a book with the noted economist. The title is Making Great Decisions in Business and Life. I think it's high time that Sacramento started making some great decisions. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks for having me. My name is Robert Meacher, County Supervisor from Plumas County. I'm a resident of uh, the new and improved uh, First Assembly District for 40 years. Uh, all three of my children were born in Plumas County, which is now part of the First AD. Uh, married 29 years, only one marriage. And we have a very small family business. After 20 years of representing Northeastern California's rural communities such as Plumas, I think I'm well situated with uh, being a, a very small, struggling, business, a mom and pop, not to mention uh, a champion for local government, uh, local control, and uh, natural resource issues such as your water and your timber and your working landscapes to be your next assemblyman. I don't think there's a candidate up here that knows the water issues from the Klamath to the Pitt, the Sacramento, the Feather, and including Lake Tahoe like I've represented these issues for a number of organizations statewide. I have some literature in the back. I look forward to talking to you all later about this very important decision you're going to have to make in November. Thank you. So we'll begin with David, and we'll start this thing rolling with a question number one. Uh, question for Rob Meacher. 
do you support single-payer health insurance, and why do you or do you not? Go. Single-payer, <clears throat> I was just watching a CNN issue on a uh, program on that last night. Uh, it's, it's not a yes or no for me. Uh, Single-payer is not necessarily the way to go, but uh, I don't think necessarily our health care system as it is provided to us with uh, uh, privately owned without any controls is the way to go either. Somewhere we got to find a way to bring the cost down. It's, it's killing local government. It's killing our families as far as financially. We've got to do something to make health care affordable, not just for people like me, but for our growing senior population and our struggling young families. So you can say I'm dodging the question, but I don't think it's a yes or no answer. You don't have to wait for me. Um, okay. You do the rebuttal. Uh, I don't think you're dodging the question. I think uh, most questions are very difficult, not yes or no. Uh, I would just like to add that uh, we need to include uh, wellness and uh, preventative health with uh, whatever we come up with. Thank you. And everyone try to keep the mic close to your mouth. My question is for Mr. Dolly. You have recently told lobbyists in Sacramento that you will not sign a no tax pledge. With Democrats in Sacramento and public employees unions trying to frantically raise taxes on businesses and the hardworking people in California, why haven't you signed a no tax pledge? And is it your intention to not sign it in order to win favor with the public employees unions who are extremely opposed to my election because of my actions in the past with them? Nobody's asked me to sign anything. And uh, I have a 16 year record of not raising taxes in Lassen County. And that's why we're debt free. My question is for uh, Mr. Bersetti. All the cities in all of the cities in California and the state are required to have a balanced budget. A balanced budget can mean many different things to different people. The city of Reading has a long-term debt of $233 million. That equates to $2,555 for every man, woman, and child in the city. You claim that Reading has a balanced budget, but in fact, you owe for ball fields, Retirement and business parks, the city of Reading is in the same financial shape as the state of California. Do you think we already have, don't you think we have already enough legislators in the capital barring against our children's future? A, fam a family of five in the city of Reading owes $12,500. general fund budget is balanced and the debt that you're referring to Mr. Dolly occurred before I got to Shasta County or to uh, the city of Reading and when I got to the city of Reading we were losing a half a million dollars a month and the people here know better they understand what we're doing here at the city of Reading we've stopped all that bleeding and we actually have a five percent reserve at this time Um, my question is for Robert, and uh, the minimum wage, I'm sorry, uh, the unemployment rate among California teenagers is 34%, and we all know how important our first job is. We get out there, we earn money, we build our resume, we get some job skills. Um, I think that this is largely a result of the minimum wage laws, which price these low-skilled workers out of jobs. Um, do you agree with me that, that the minimum wage laws should just be scrapped? Uh, let's simply put no. That gives him a lot of time to rebut. Well, thank you for your response. Um, I would like to just end with a quote by a Nobel Prize winning economist from 1970, and you'll have to understand that wages were less in 1970. 
Uh, this is Paul Samuelson. He said, quote, what good is it to a black youth to know that an employer must pay him $2 an hour if the fact that he must be paid that amount is what keeps him from getting a job? Minimum wage laws are actually keeping the poor um, and the youth in our country unemployed. Thank you. This could be actually for all of you, and it could end up being for all of you, but I'll start with you, Rick, since you're the local character of color here. Uh, notwithstanding your, uh, your, your career in Major League Baseball and your notoriety here uh, in the Reading area, uh, as was explained by Dan, this new district is huge. It's about the size of South Carolina, and it has a, a lot of issues that go beyond uh, the city uh, of Reading. What, what have you done in your life experience, in your uh, either personal or uh, professional career, to prepare yourself to represent such a, a huge area? And if you have the time, what do you think is the number one issue facing this new First Assembly District? I think the number one thing is to get, that, get the state out of the way to create jobs. But what I've done personally in my life experiences, my years uh, involvement in my local community, um, on the advisory board at Mercy Hospital, I believe I can help with the rural health situations we have up where you are. We need to get the ability for the small rural hospitals to hire their own docs. 20 years in technology, I, can, I understand how that works very, very well. Um, I have my own little electric company, an electric producing plant. We sell, I've been selling power to PG&E. I understand how FERC works. I was a liaison for the Reading Electric Utilities um, REU for two years. $165 million budget. Lobbied in Washington, D.C. for a reduction on the CVPIA, which was successful here just recently. Legislation passed. It's going to save the city of Reading over a million dollars this year. So I have quite a bit of varied experience. And I'm not uh, one-dimensional at all. I, I, would, I would just add that that's very good, and I think that's fine for the folks here in Reading. But I, I think that there's, there's massive issues facing the working people, especially the struggling small families of northeastern California that, that seriously need to be addressed. Uh, some folks will say it's all about the taxes, but I can tell you as a small business owner, it's about the stinking fees we got to pay every single person. We are bled to death by these fees. And it's not, it's not equitable at all. I have found out uh, in my years in business that it costs the average mom and pop 37% more to do business in California than the larger guys. So not even being in a trade association can help us. It's going to take a strong voice in Sacramento to make sure that our struggling very micro businesses get some relief. Thanks, Rick. Uh, Brian Dolly, um, assuming the theory of peak oil is correct, and soon uh, we either will not have fuel, fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides, or they become too expensive, how do you see agriculture adapting? Well, thanks for that softball since I'm in agriculture. Uh, we can adapt. We have to have fuel, we have to have fertilizer, and we have to have uh, sprays to, to, to feed the world, which we do. And uh, the cost of those are driving us up out of business. And we cannot compete with the world with other countries who aren't under the same regulations that we are. So as a legislator in Sacramento, I will work really hard to drive those costs down, open up our our uh, natural resources that we have here and use those to keep us in parity with the rest of the world. Um, Brian again. Um, you've told people you're a proud member of the uh, California Sierra Nevada Conservancy, a group of environmentalists, supervisors, and bureaucrats. Your stated goal is to improve the environmental, economic, and social well-being of its communities. Specifically, during your time on the Conservancy, how many jobs have you provided to the people who have lost their jobs to the environmental overregulation? Yes, I am a proud member of the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. Um, I represent the northern region, which is Lassen, 
Modoc and Shasta County. I was chosen by the boards of supervisors to represent them. Uh, in the time that I've been on the board, my goal has been to uh, direct those Prop 84 funds towards fire safe councils and doing chipping projects to keep the federal forest who doesn't manage their lands from burning out our communities. And so, yes, it has created jobs. It's put uh, chips into our biomass plants and it's helped uh, keep the fire and uh, the environment close to our community safe. And I'm proud of that. And I will continue uh, for the rest of this year to uh, work towards putting those people to work and taking care of our communities. Um, as a rebuttal, specifically how many jobs, as I've been through the district here, there isn't a cogen plant running now uh, in, in the district. They've all been shut down. And so if cogen is what you're referring to here, I'm just curious as to the people who have lost their jobs working. Yeah, you can't answer. You'll have to. No, but later on you can bring it up somehow. Can I use some of my time? No. <laughs> but you can, you can ask a question uh, or bring it up uh, later in the debate. That's okay. I have, I have an opportunity to ask a question, but before I ask that question, I'm going to answer that there are cogeneration plants running in the district, and there are one in Lassen County, and there are several in Shasta County. So there are running. My question is number two is for Mr. Meacher. You, have, uh, you, and, you and I have worked as county supervisors for the past 16 years, you for 20 years, on issues impacting rural California. A small group of conservatives in Sacramento have worked hard each year to stop the increase of a $60 million tax last year alone. If you are elected, will you vote with the majority party for the tax increases and in fees? Uh, clarifying question before I answer. Okay, can I do that? Okay, uh, you you're talking about the governor's proposal that's out there now, the initiative? To send it to the voters? No, I'm talking about the raising in taxes that the you, the party that you belong to has been oh, pushing towards us. Oh, you're saying a supermajority override so that it just goes into place uh, without a vote of the people? I'm asking you if you will vote for the budgets that they've been voting for down there oh. as a party line vote. No, absolutely not. Uh, for folks who may not know, because uh, I have a red shirt on, I, I'm a rural Democrat. A rural Democrat makes me as liberal as an urban Republican to some people. When you, when, when you go to Sacramento, that's what they tell me. I go to see Democrats, they say you're too uh, conservative. When I go see Republicans, they say you're a Democrat. So it makes me more like an independent. Uh, with that in mind, uh, I, I'm in a unique position because the majority party down there doesn't, doesn't hold me hostage to, to saying no when it's necessary to say no. And my, 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 so my answer to you, Brian, is no. I, I will not lock arms with the, the majority party just to go along to get along. You and I know we've worked independently and fought for issues over the years uh, that are important to rural California. So the answer is no. Good. I'm going to rebut the question I wasn't able to answer before. <clears throat> uh, you know, the question was asked about jobs in the district. And I will say to you, I provide jobs full and part-time at my own business. And I also worked for many years. I was a member of the Quincy Library Group when I first was elected. And that was to create fire breaks in our district. I lobbied that Congressman Herger and Diane Feinstein co-authored that legislation at the federal level. I've been working very hard to take care of our forest and our watersheds. There are cogeneration plants that are running. There's one in Lassen County. There have been two, one that shut down in Lassen and one in, in uh, Shasta. And it's not due to the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. It's due to the rate over regulations, the PUC uh, not giving out contracts into those windmills and, and uh, uh, excuse me, uh, photovoltaics, uh, they're getting tax credits that the, that the uh, cogeneration plants are not getting, and so it's not a fair market out there. 
So uh, this is for David. You, you need a question over there. So, so the government's forever telling us that we, the taxpayers, need to invest in infant industries until they get up off the ground and can stand on their own two feet. So a perfect example of this is the solar power industry and, and a poster child is Solyndra, the company that went bankrupt. And so um, my question for you is, do you think the government is actually capable of of understanding these, these industries, the trends in the industries, which companies to invest in uh, without making it a, a political football? Probably not. Um, the, in my opinion, the, the purpose of government is to provide services for the people, uh, police and uh, fire and that sort of thing and to provide an even playing field. Uh, and if possible, and I don't know, uh, government's fairly complicated. I was a general manager of a special, district, special services district providing water, wastewater, lights, streets, all that sort of thing, and had to deal with lots of governmental stuff. Uh, it would be nice if, in fact, uh, government could provide uh, startup stuff, but I think that uh, more we need to look within ourselves and our own communities to provide our own startup situations, uh, use our own equities and so on. Um, and because I think looking towards government is kind of an end in itself. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to add that um, there is a whole industry out there, venture capitalists and agile investors whose very job uh, is to find startup companies and to fund them. And what happens when the government starts doing it, and I think that the government can't ever know enough about these industries to do it well, what happens is the, the funding goes to the politi politically connected uh, uh, companies like Solyndra, and it sets up a very perverse incentive uh, system for them where if they succeed, their investors, their managers, their employees do well, and if they fail, we the taxpayers end up with the bill. So it's heads, they win, tails, we lose. That's a bad bet for us. Uh, Ten seconds of float time. I agree with you. My question is of, uh, of Brian, following uh, more <clears throat> or less on the question that you asked me about the uh, majority party and the budget. Uh, when I got into this race, I, I made it perfectly clear uh, to those uh, big shots in Sacramento that I would be the only Democrat on this ticket or I wouldn't even consider this. And that, that's because I, I just won't let the party push me around. And that was the first test of fire. No one else was put up. I have received the endorsement at the, at the annual um, convention in San Diego as a result, just by proxy, because I'm the only one up here. Uh, some folks will say I'm nuts for doing it. But um, I, I think there's a lot of, of, of rural Democrat can do to represent folks. Brian. Uh, the Republicans uh, recently had their uh, state convention, and uh, as far as I know, there, there's no endorsement for any Democrat in Northeastern California as a result of that convention. You mean Re excuse me, Republican. I'm hoping they're not endorsing. Right. Thank you. Uh, what, what's up with the Republican Party not taking a position on um, getting behind any of the candidates? Well. Um, that's a good question, Robert. And I was endorsed by Lassen County Central Committee. I don't believe any other candidate was endorsed uh, by any other central committees. And I don't know why I didn't get the endorsement. It's, uh, I guess politics is uh, interesting even in my own party. But uh, it didn't happen, and that's the way it works uh, in the open primary process that we're in right now. They did endorse for incumbents, but they didn't do it in the open race. And uh, can I ask, uh, uh, clarifying. So it's a rebuttal. So. It's a rebuttal, so he can't respond. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah, if he's a good note taker, I was just kidding. If, if he's a good note taker, he'll bring it up later. Right. Right. Well, I, I would I would just go to say that that that, that I find it very interesting that the, as much as I love my Republican colleagues, that there's there's something afoot if the party can't get behind a candidate, and it's not that none of you are worthy. Uh, of that designation, and I, I think it's a disservice uh, to these candidates uh, that the party wouldn't step up and, and give an endorsement. That's all I have to say about that. 
We'll pause and go over the float time. Here's Elizabeth. No, no, she's going to give you your total float time left. Okay, David, you have five minutes and 45 seconds to use as you please. Uh, Rick, you've got five minutes and 30 seconds. Brian, same, five minutes and 30 seconds. Charlie, you've got four minutes and 45 seconds. And Robert, you've got the most to say tonight, and you've got three minutes and 45 seconds. So we'll start with question number three, David. Uh, Charlie Hooper, uh, do you support single payer health care and comments? Uh, the very short answer is definitely not. Um, I'm actually in the healthcare field, and I see a number of problems with our current uh, pre-Obamacare uh, healthcare system. And in my opinion, Obamacare fixed exactly zero of them. Um, so I do think that there's a lot of things that should be fixed, but I think giving uh, healthcare to the government is exactly the wrong thing to do. Uh, do your comments include the uh, SB 810 of California as well? Brian, this question will be on property rights. In my meetings in Lassen County, it constantly comes up that you are a property rights guy. And in Assembly District 1, our economy has taken a real huge hit. So why would you have voted against the 635-acre Eagle Lake Estate subdivision in Lassen County? Your appointed planning commission approved this by 5-0, and all this person needed was a use permit to move forward. The property was purchased by the developer 40 years ago and was rezoned or was zoned residential at the time of purchase. So why did you vote against creating these jobs and, and violating his property rights? I am a proponent of private property rights, but I am also a proponent of keeping the public safe through the zoning laws. And in that case, it was a 4-1 vote. The one vote that voted for this project was the gentleman that got $1,000 in his campaign from the proponent. The project was not safe. It did not have a second access. And if a fire came through there, those folks would have been burned up, just like in Oakland Hills. And I wouldn't be able to look those people in the face if somebody died up there. And so if he would have got the second access, I would approve that subdivision. Well, in reading the minutes of your planning commission and the Forest Service's information, um, all he needed was your use permit. The Forest Service was requiring that before they would give him the secondary access. He was already told, yes, you can have the secondary access. What you need to do is go to your supervisors, get the use permit, and then we will then allow the secondary access. So that argument didn't really hold much. Well it's, the, well, it's the truth, and at, at the end of the day, the Planning Commission is an advisory board. They don't have this, they don't say the law. He appealed it to the board, and the board was a 4-1 vote. And uh, okay, that's part of the question. Too. So go ahead with your question. That'll be part of the question, but go ahead. Uh, my question is for Mr. Bassetti, and I'm excited that he's been asking me a lot of questions tonight. It seems to be I'm a threat to him, and that's great. Um, I have a question for you. You know, you, you tout that your, uh, your vote, your uh, Measure A and Measure B are two of your things that you're proud of, which uh, those cost the taxpayers of your county somewhere around $20,000 to put those out. And uh, isn't it your job as a uh, commissioner to know where the people are at and just go ahead and take those actions? And then after, you've after you did get your advisory vote, the following vote, uh, later on, which was a 4-1 vote, which you had one person vote against, you gave the, ta the takeaways that you did with your bargaining units in a tax raise to them. So I don't understand why you would take away and then give them back a raise. Maybe you can explain that to the taxpayers of the city of Reading. I'm trying to think what question it was you wanted me to answer. Did you want me to answer? I'm not sure what you wanted me to answer. There was about four questions there, Brian. Um, you want to... Is, is, it okay, is it okay if he tries it again? It'll come off the float time, if he's got to clarify. Oh, well, the first part what was the, the first part was uh, costing twenty thousand dollars. That was what the unions were advertising it was going to be. 
It costs us $10,000 to have it on the ballot. And uh, Measure B is saving $27 million at first look off of our deferred liability cost. And we got $6.5 million in concessions from our unions. I think it was a fair price for that. I guess the question was, is why would you spend the taxpayer's do dollar? When you're elected, you're elected to do the job. You don't need to ask the folks on a referendum vote and, and spend money to get the answers. You should know that. You're elected. So my next question is for Robert. And I live in Nevada County, and we are blessed with an abundance of public charter schools. Uh, so students in Nevada County can choose to go to the regular public government kind of traditional school, or they can go to the public uh, charter schools. And what's interesting is the money actually goes with the student. So this is a perfect example of the, the educational choice system or the voucher system, which has been criticized by a uh, number of people, inclu including progressives. But don't you think that all students in California should have this ability? Well, I don't know about all school students in California because, as you know, districts are all different in how they're organized and operated. But I can tell you, in my experience, uh, with the struggling rural schools, in many cases, it's the perfect marriage uh, to have. And we're looking at that at one of our schools right now that's struggling due to low attendance because there's uh, because of a number of reasons there's a shrinking uh, student rate. And we all are affected by that uh, in, as you get more, in more rural areas of Northeastern California. So uh, yes, this opportunity should make itself available where it's a good fit. And uh, the school that my kids went to is looking at uh, a great merger right now where you can have the charter within the public school, actually. And uh, everyone gets the credits and, and the money flows. So. I don't think there's a bad idea out there when it comes to giving our kids a good education. Thank you for that response. That was very helpful. And i just like to add that um, the school choice or the voucher system idea has been criticized by a lot of Democrats and so-called progressives um, as actually having the ability to hurt uh, the poor and, and minorities um, in the state. But if you think about it, how do people go to a better school? Well, they dig deep in their own pocket to pay for private school, or they move to a better neighborhood. Now, people who are in bad neighborhoods are typically poor, and they don't have either of these abilities. So when, when students can pick the school to, that they want to go to, and the money goes with them, um, what we're doing is we're giving uh, the, the most underprivileged kids in this, in this state the ability that the wealthy already have. And I think it's a win-win for everybody. Thank you. So I'm going to go back to my uh, uh, partner, Brian, here, uh, who may not call me a partner at the end of the evening. Uh, and once again, it's on uh, 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 going along with the, the budget that's produced by the, uh, the legislature. Uh, a number of years ago, a very bold and uh, courageous uh, legislator from this area, Dick Dickerson, came up with a, a plan to permanently fund rural law enforcement at a half million dollars a year. And that is still in place. And, and Dick worked with his party, he worked with the governor, he worked with the legislature to see that that was put in place. And it's one of the greatest things that's happened to our uh, rural county sheriffs in the 20 years that I've been an elected official. But, he had to go along with the state budget, and he had to agree to sign the budget to do that. So my question to you, Brian, if, if, if presented that opportunity, would you say no, or would you say yes? Would you represent your constituents, or the pledge of no taxes? I thank you for that question, Mr. Meacher, and uh, I do thank Dick Dickerson for that vote. It has helped my county and it's helped do law enforcement, but I don't believe at the state level there is a problem with revenue. There's a problem with spending, and so I think that the legislature needs to get their priorities straight, take care of the rules, rule law enforcement, 
but I, I don't believe in raising taxes. I haven't for 16 years, and I won't be pro, uh, voting for taxes. Uh, we need to just educate them on how they should prioritize their spending. So my rebuttal to that is, is the very reason why I'm running for this position. And that is, Dick was hammered by the party for making that tough choice for his constituents. And I, I laud him for that. He's one of my heroes in Northeastern California. I'm in a unique position where I won't have a party come down on my butt because I do the right thing for the people of Northeastern California. They might come down on me, but they can't do anything about it. They can't run me out of office. They won't run me out of office. It's, it's, I don't sign uh, an oath to, or, or take a pledge or, or, or some other deal. I represent the people of Northeastern California, and I do it whether or not it's my political butt or not. But in this case, I can negotiate. And that's something that perhaps my rural uh, and libertarian friends can't do without being beaten up by their own party. Well, I just want to say one thing, because I always see you guys hesitate when that red light comes up, because it, you know, it means bad, stop. But uh, you can keep going if you've got float time. Okay. <laughs> Final question, then. Okay, Rick, um, what do you see as the issues for our district? Where do you begin? I mean, uh, the jobs that we're losing in the forest, that's why... Uh, you know, Sierra Pacific Industries and Roseburg and Burning Forest Products, these people are, are getting strongly behind me to try to get some of those deregulations that we have out there less, and so we can't put people more back in the woods. Rural health. I was up at Mayor's Memorial Hospital. Their Portola lost their doctor. Mayor's Memorial is contracting out of Dallas to have three doctors come in there. There are so many different issues that we have here, and then when you start talking about the property rights, and how the bureaucrats have got a target on Northern California, Northeastern and Northern California, the people in Siskiyou specifically. It's, uh, it's going to be a multi-pronged battle that we're going to have to go down there and fight. And if you don't have a lot of good allies to do that, you're not going to be successful. Surprise, Brian. Um, as supervisor, you recently supported a transfer of water from Lassen County into the state of Nevada. This transfer was small, and, uh, but I feel that the precedents uh, created might be somewhat dangerous. Um, two part, how much compensation did your people in Lassen County receive for this water transfer? And then with this track record, should we believe that you won't allow our North State water to be exported to places like Southern California? Uh, thank you for that question. That is true that uh, the county did take an action actually last week, and I'm glad you're monitoring uh, what we're doing up there. Uh, it's a private property right. Uh, Lassen County was one of the first counties along with Sierra County to put into place groundwater rights, and that was because we had the state of uh, Nevada trying to take our water and use it for municipalities. In this case, uh, the landowner happened to be in the uh, circumstance where the county or the state line went right through his property. He had a well on the, on the California side, the center pivot to irrigate his fields on the Nevada side. And we did give him a three-year permit. It's irrevocable. It has to be used just for ag. Uh, we have a monitor going to be at the well and at the pivot showing three cubic CSF. Uh, per, three cubic CSF. Uh, and so we did take that action. I looked at it more as a pro-business action. This, uh, person has 20 people employed. If those jobs would have been on Main Street uh, in Susanville, the people would have been outraged about it. It was a 5-0 vote. Every single board member voted for it. We put into place uh, an ability to take it back, and we will not be exporting water to municipalities uh, as long as I'm on the board. We will be taking care of those private property rights for landowners, and I stand behind that. Well, we don't know still if Lassen County received any compensation, I guess it was because it's your, your feeling of the private rights there. And we don't know if you would have supported the water possibly going to Sacramento or, or being further south into Southern California.
Uh, yeah, it was your question. Uh, I have a minute to ask a question, correct? Well, that was Bassetti's question. So um, he rebutted, so now it's your question. I have 30 seconds to ask the question. Right. First of all, the Lassen County did not receive any compensation. We don't ask anybody that has a well in Lassen County now to compensate the county. Uh, a lot of water went to his own land. My question is for Mr. Hooper, and I would ask that how are you going to go to Sacramento and uh, bring us jobs and create revenue? Uh, thank you, Brian, for that question. Um, I think it's pretty easy that uh, what stands in the way of jobs and the economy is taxes and regulation. Uh, California has long been one of the premier taxers and regulators of business, and uh, it's estimated to cost $500 billion a year in the state of California just for these regulations alone. That's $13,000 per uh, person in this room, everybody $13,000. $52,000 for a family of four. So each uh, family of four in California could buy two nice new cars per year if we didn't have to worry about these regulations. Okay, uh, my question is for Brian. And um, uh, something you said earlier uh, made me think of you here. Um, do you believe in the free market and free trade, or do you think that the, the state or federal government should protect American workers, whether they be steel workers, auto workers, or farmers? I believe in uh, the free market, but I also believe that government needs to get out of it and totally out of it, because government, through their regulation, picks winners and losers. And so... That's, that's through the grant system, and that's through regulation. So if government would get totally out of my life, I would be a lot better. I could create more jobs and do a lot better in my own business. So I, I think that we need an even playing field. For those of us in business, it's very difficult to uh, stay in business when your competitors are, have regulations that you don't have to... Uh, uh, they, they don't have them. Sometimes you have them. As far as globally goes, um, we should do everything to keep jobs here in America. We are, we are, through our regulatory laws, we are shipping jobs out of this country, and it's devastating our economies. And they're shipping us back food and materials that don't meet our standards. Thank you, Brian. Um, yeah, I'd just like to add that there are, um, in addition to the problems you just mentioned, there are other problems uh, with the government trying to protect jobs, and that's that by trying to protect jobs, it actually hurts American jobs. So just take steel workers, for example. You keep out imported steel, you help American steel workers. That sounds good, except for every American steel worker, there's 57 American workers who use steel. So when the price goes up, they're hurt. Also, everything that we consumers buy that has steel in it, the price goes up on that too, so we're hurt. It's two problems. The third problem is you can start a trade war with these foreign countries, and that hurts everybody. And then the last thing is just the cost alone of trying to protect these jobs can be outrageous. There are American uh, luggage manufacturing workers who have protected jobs at a cost of $1.3 million per job per year. That's crazy. Thank you. My question's for Rick. Uh, you were talking to Supervisor Dolly about uh, transfer of water and his, uh, uh, would he be in favor of, of shipping water south. Uh, Congress just passed H.R. 1837. It's the Nunez-McClintock bill. Uh, a lot of folks aren't familiar with this bill, but uh, there are some who say it's one of the largest water grabs of Northern California to send the water south in decades. Uh, as this is a, a, a Republican bill, Rick, uh, where do you stand on, on that bill, and what would you do to fix it if you became elected? Well, if I could be persuasive enough to change people's minds, Robert, I would. Because uh, the first intake for that project there, the pipe setting, is going to take eight acres, the last eight acres that my grandmother had from the 1850s, right on the Sacramento River, just upstream from uh, Hood. And uh, so, you know, we've got to find other ways to do it. And um, I would not have voted for that legislation. Once again, this is the most insidious piece of legislation that I've seen in 20 years in office, and uh, 
It sailed, it sailed through the House of Representatives. I believe it will be killed in the Senate, but everybody in this room should be concerned about it. It's just another typical example of Southern California water interest coming up here in Northern California, hoping to catch us asleep, hoping to say because it's a good Republican bill that we should be in favor of it, and it's uh, the farthest from the truth. So, uh, Ricky hit it on the head. I'm proud of you for that one. I don't think there's a person here that sitting up here, if you knew the details, would support that bill. Okay, now we'll give you, Elizabeth will give you your uh, remaining float time and you can make a closing statement. Okay, um, David, you have eight minutes and 15 seconds. Uh, not likely. I uh, enjoyed being the dark horse here and listening. Uh, as I stated, I uh, ran a special uh, district in the state of California. I worked as an engineering contractor for 20 years doing uh, public works jobs in water and wastewater. Uh, I think I agree with everybody on this board that one of our most important issues here in this district is water and keeping our water. Uh, we have a very strange, bizarre system of water rights. Um, however, the uh, overriding interest is just protecting our water and keeping it from going south. Uh, secondly, uh, I would go one further in that I think that we should have rivers for fish in them. Um, and sometimes that's uh, in uh, disagreement with some of the farming interests. And I think that we can work out uh, compromises on that. Um, we, as a uh, people in the state of California, uh, have been uh, very creative. Uh, we've uh, built the computer industry and a number of other things. And I agree with uh, Charlie in that I think we need to look to ourselves for our own ingenuity and our own jobs. I don't think the state's going to do much for us. And I think uh, whichever of the five of us go to California, one of our biggest jobs is going to be protecting our constituency from the state. Uh, I would be representing the constituency to the state, not the other direction. Uh, and I thank the Tea Party for this uh, gathering here, and I appreciate being invited. Thank you. Okay, Rick, seven minutes and 45 seconds. Well, not likely again. Thanks. We really appreciate it. You know, I mentioned to some of the people here tonight that these people here at the Tea Party put on the best forums. I said, you won't hear cackling. You won't hear anything. There's no booing, no hissing, no plotting, no anything. You guys are always so respectful. You're so well educated on all the issues, too. And so uh, for that, I'm proud that uh, all these people that come to Reading and don't know us uh, have a chance to see this. And, and again, you've done marvelously tonight. And thank you for that. And um, hopefully tonight also that you'll see that, uh, that I'm a candidate for you to send down to Sacramento. Upon the examination of both my supporter list and my endorsement list, you'll see that I have far and away more support than any of the other candidates. On my list are some of the most prominent, largest, and long-time existing private industry leaders. They have the faith in me that I'll be able to affect change in Sacramento. We were talking about Sierra Pacific Industries, Roseburg Lumber, and Bernie Forge Products in the timber and mill world. From the medical community, I have the support of the California Hospital Association that represents 15 hospitals within the boundaries of District 1. Shasta Regional Medical Center, Owens Pharmacy are local endorsers. The California Dental Association has also included their support. In the building and construction trades, we have the Shasta Builders Exchange, Palomar Construction, Signature Northwest Partners, LCS Development, Tyrone Fuller, and Hat Creek Construction and Materials, just to name a few. And many of those people, folks, with those new permits that we brought out from the city by reducing our impact fees by 33%, have put over 65 people back to work in the last two weeks here in Reading. <clears throat> From the engineering world, we have CH2M Hill, Simmons General Engineering, and the statewide organization, the California American Council of Engineering Companies, the California Restaurant Association, 
C.R. Gibbs, the Black Bear Diner chain, and LG Enterprise are a few of the restaurant people who are backing me as well. I can go on and on with over 185 separate and distinct financial contributors to date and more endorsements. Why are these people and organizations putting their trust in me? Because when they have looked at my past record, they understand that I'm trustworthy, reliable, and a man of integrity. I want to share a bit of my personal life with you now. I was born here in Reading. I'm one of eight children of Paul and Gloria. My dad was a mill worker. I grew up not knowing that we had nothing. My life was full of brothers and sisters and summers of playing sandlot baseball and swimming in the canal. You know, we went to church on Sundays and enjoyed friends. What a way to grow up. In Shasta County, it was truly Americana. Now I have four adult children from the ages of soon to be 33, 31, 28, and 26. And I'll start with my son, Damon. Eagle Scout, 1450 on the SATs, nationally recognized freestyle swimmer, five years in the Air Force, left with the rank of captain from the nuclear missile program. And he now lives in Boston, Massachusetts. My oldest daughter, Alicia, is an assistant project manager for a large software training company in Chicago. It is her responsibility to make sure that her company's clients are trained and satisfied. And she has continued to impress the management of her company with her promotions. Allie left us many years ago to attend the University of Portland. Ryan is my second daughter, and she graduated summa cum laude from the McLaren School of Business at the University of San Francisco. She's currently living in Portland, Oregon, and is what is referred to as an editorial stylist. She travels the world in her business, and Dad still doesn't understand it all. She's also an author and a video producer. Mia is my youngest, and she also graduated summa cum laude, and that means 375 or better. It took me a while. It took the second one for me to figure that one out. She has a master's degree in criminal justice and is living in Reno, Nevada. She currently works in the Jan Evans Youth Center there and works with the young female offenders. I'm so proud of all of my children. I waited before to get involved in the political world to where I could give my kids the best start and get them out in the world. Remember, folks, back when Reading was losing $500,000 a month, it appeared that there was no hope. Every month, the news just continued to get more and more bleak. Very difficult and hard decisions had to be made, and I helped make them. Many were not popular, but still the decisions were made. The $360 million budget in Reading is balanced, and our reserve is over 5%, and we're still delivering the quality services that are necessary to our citizens. It's not easy. We know that. And we know that there's still a lot of challenges ahead. Now, I have, in fact, signed a pledge to protect you from any tax increases, and I have received the endorsement from the National Tax Limitation Committee from President Lou Euler. Most importantly, we get back to why the private sector businesses who are endorsing me want me in Sacramento, and that is to eliminate the unnecessary regulations that are choking California to death and to stimulate job growth. My experience with the unions and what we went through is dramatically different than what any of my opponents have ever even come close to. You were witnesses to that. You saw it. You saw the $185,000 being spent here. And you, and you actually had the signs right out here in front of your meeting places night after night. I can do the job for you, and I will do the job for you. Thank you very much for this evening. Okay, Brian, you also have uh, pretty close to that. You've got seven minutes and 45 seconds. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the opportunity uh, for the Tea Party folks to invite me down here. I want to thank their other candidates, too, tonight. Uh, this isn't easy. Uh, getting up and uh, putting your whole life out on the line is uh, sometimes difficult. Uh, I've been doing it for 16 years in Lassen County. I want to just take a minute to let you know me a little better than uh, what we've heard here in the question and answer period. Uh, my grandfather homesteaded in Siskiyou County in the 1930s, and uh, he was a World War I veteran, and he was able to draw a homestead. That's what brought him to California. In the 40s, he brought, bought the property in Lassen County, where I currently farm. 
But I want to back you up a little bit to that, that homestead. In 2001, the federal government had stolen our water for a sucker fish. <clears throat> Sorry, I get a little bit emotional. It's the only time I ever saw my father cry. Um, they took the water from our farms to save a fish in the Klamath Lake. Now, 10 years later, in 2011, they're trying to save the coho salmon on the Klamath River. The water from the Klamath Lake goes into the Klamath River. The water for the sucker fish is warm water. The water for the coho salmon is cold water. Now, they're talking about taking out dams, which I'm totally opposed to. But it's really, in the end run, it's not about the environment. It's not about the fish. It's about taking our private property rights away. Our th the greatest thing about America is the right to own something. There's a lot of countries that have constitutions, and they allow you to you know, have some rights. But the greatest thing about America is we can own a piece of dirt. And I'll quote my grandfather, who said, you better get some of it. They're not making any more. Along with you that own a house or a couple acres, you know, the federal government, through the navigable waters, wanted to regulate the water that comes off of your roof into the gutter as navigable waters. I've been fighting those fights in Washington and at the state level. So I understand what it means to own a piece of ground. I understand what it means to put somebody to work. I also understand what it means to balance a budget in a county environment and deal with unions and people that need to work. But I also know that at the end of the day, we do need some services from our, from our public agencies. Uh, over the 16 years that I've been in office, the number one thing I will tell you that people care about is public safety. Dick, Dish Dick Dickerson understands it. That's why he sent money to the rural counties. When you pick up the phone and you dial 911, you want somebody to, in an ambulance, a fire truck, or a police car to respond because you need some help. In Lassen County, our sheriff came to us last year with his budget, and we asked, told him, Dean, that's not enough money. We know that the unemployment rate is 16% is what the state tells us, but we know that it's a really about 20%. As the unemployment rate goes up, so does crime. We allocated $240,000 more in his budget than he asked for. Now you ask, how can you do that? Every budget is a difficult budget. I don't care if the dot-com thing was going and the housing market was going up. It's always difficult. But because of my conservative values and my board, I cannot take all the credit for it, we've been conservative all along. And we've said no to the unions. And we've been fair, but we've said no, and we've been able to balance our budgets, have a reserve, and pay our debt off. That is why I'm the most qualified candidate to go to Sacramento. The counties are an extension of the state. We end up with realignment that's coming down. And I'm, I don't know how much time I have, but I want to talk about this for a minute. The counties are going to house state criminals in our county jails. That is going to impact your county budget more than you even know, because they're going to send it to us, send them to us without the money to pay for the bill, because the counties can do it cheaper. That's going to impact your general fund in your county, and when you want to have that law enforcement person show up, they're going to cut there first. So for the last 16 years, I've been on the receiving end of the state's mismanagement of our budgets. I'm going to go to Sacramento. I'm going to promote jobs get regulation out of the way for our businesses, and I will do, uh, I have experience in that. I want to also mention in my last couple minutes that as I went back out to my car tonight, I found a flyer on my windshield that said, Brian Daly received payments totaling $183,594 from 1995 to 2010 in crop subsidies. Well, I want to ask you, take a good look at this. There are some conservation subsidies, which I paid 50% to do conservation work on my land. And yes, I do get, uh, well, I call it a, a tax credit, just like you would for wind industry, wind, in, wind industry or for uh, uh, solar. But at the end of the day, Charlie brought up a good point. They pit one business against another through, through these tax incentives. And I happen to have to compete in my business. And so the reason that I have this, this subsidy, it came with my ranch, 
is to, so I can stay in business. The margins in agriculture are very thin. And if we want to continue to have a product to put on the shelves for American people and for the world, we need to get government clear out of our lives. And I would be more than happy to see these tax incentives go away. And by the way, I've paid more in taxes every year than I've ever received in any subsidy. And you can go look at my tax records for that. So I wanted to close by saying I'm the most qualified person. I'm doing this not because I want a title of an assembly member. I'm doing this for my children, your children, and our businesses. I thank you for letting me come here. Go to www.briandaly.com. Look at my website. Call me. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions. And God bless America and God bless the Tea Party for stepping up to the plate and saying no to government. It's you folks that make it great for us. And I'm behind you and we can do it together. Thank you. Charlie, five minutes and 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, so I'll just give you my whole life story. No, actually, I'm not going to. <laughs> but I would like to thank you very much for inviting all of us here tonight. It's been a wonderful event, and, and you've run it marvelously. So I am a little bit embarrassed to admit that I was not born in Redding. Um, but I have lived almost my whole life in California. And my family's actually been in this country a very long time. My mom does genealogy. I actually had an ancestor uh, in Jamestown, and I have uh, about a half a dozen uh, ancestors who fought in the Revolutionary War, inc including a general, Israel Putnam. Um, and I live in Grass Valley with my wife and uh, uh, one teenage son who's in high school, and then uh, my other son is uh, attending college in, in upstate New York. And just, I'm going to go through my background really briefly here and try not to bore you too much. I have uh, engineering degrees from Santa Clara University and Stanford University. I worked at NASA for seven years in Mountain View. Um, I am president of a consulting company that I uh, co-founded 18 years ago. And uh, my writing has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Reason, the Washington Times, I'm a visiting fellow with the Hoover Institution. It's a think tank at Stanford University. Um, I am uh, chairman of the board at a uh, high school in Grass Valley. And I've also been uh, the president of my road association for the last decade. Um, and I coach and play soccer. Um, and um, why I'm running is I'm afraid that California is going to turn into the next Greece the country, Greece. Um, the unemployment rate in California is 10.9%, which is higher than any state except for Nevada and Rhode Island. With 12% of America's population, we have a third, a third of all the welfare recipients in this state. So I am socially tolerant and fiscally conservative. I believe in the United States Constitution limited governments, low taxes, and balanced budgets. I am a political outsider. I'm not a politician. I have no long-term uh, aspirations to be a politician. I want to get in, help things, and then go back to my life to be a, a citizen politician. I am not running uh, for big unions, big companies. I'm running for the little guy, the small business owner like myself, the worker, the taxpayer, just the regular Californian who seems to never get a voice. I will be your voice in Sacramento, and I will try to be some adult supervision for Sacramento. Thank you very much. Um, and Charlie, could you give your mic to Robert? I think he's having trouble with yours up in the sound booth. So you'll need to take uh, Charlie's mic. This isn't work. Uh, our sound guy told us. Oh, okay. He, he's got the magic back there in the in the box. You've got two minutes and 15 seconds. I know. You had a lot to say tonight, Robert. Thanks for having me. Good night. <laughs> no. I got two seconds. So how do I stand out differently? My Republican friends, as well-meaning as they want to be to go to Sacramento, have one big advantage. The majority party is going to step all over them. I can go down there and negotiate. If they negotiate, then they're beat up by their party. They caught, they're caught in a catch-22. I'm a rural Democrat. That makes me a unique breed in California. Federally, you'd call me a blue dog. But in this case, there's, 
I, since I have such a small amount of time, 20 years in local government, 21 years in a mom and pop business that struggled, I know exactly what we need to do, exactly, to relieve small businesses of overburdensome regulation, overcosting regulation. 13 years, United States Merchant Marine, seeing a little bit of the world, jobs, jobs in the woods, on the land, in our small towns, investing in our kids. It's a travesty we spend $4,700 educating our 12 to K, K through 12 kids, and $51,000 to incarcerate someone for a year. Sacramento needs to be smacked in the face. They need someone from their own cloth to tell them they've gone the wrong path. I think I can do that, and I can do that and represent everyone. I can work across the aisle. I have for 20 years in local government. I've survived. I'm not a career person. I believe I owe it to the people of California and northeastern California where I've been working on watershed issues, water issues, timber issues for 20 years. So I'd like you to take a hard look. I know that, and I thank the Tea Party folks. Every time I talk to Tea Party people, they say, we don't care about the party you represent. We care about what you stand for and your goals. My goals are your goals. Let's do this together. Thank you. OK, time to clap. Well, thank you, folks, for coming up and participating in this debate today. And I hope it went well for everyone. Um, yes, but just, 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 just stay up. <laughs> You remembered. Is uh, just arm? Uh, excuse me. Uh, stay up there for a while. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. And I hope you received a lot of information that you would not have otherwise heard. And uh, then now the candidates will go to the classrooms. And let's give them a big hand of applause. <laughs>